Hello, this is David. This is Salome. And welcome to Something Old, Something New, the movie podcast where we choose two films, one old, one new, that have something in common, and what that is depends on the film. This week, we're going to be discussing the 1976 release of Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver, starring Robert De Niro, and the 2019 release of Joker, directed by Todd Phillips and starring Joaquin Phoenix. And what both films have in uh, common, there are you know several different elements. Where like number one, where we have a uh, protagonist uh, mental instability. It's you know in the case of Travis Bickle and Taxi Driver, he himself is a uh, Vietnam War veteran, uh, bouting with uh, battling uh, bouts of depression, um, uh, insomnia. And in the case of Joker, where we have Arthur, who he himself is mentally unstable, which trauma. Is, it's from a traumatic mm-hmm. event when he was a child where he was hit really hard in the head. And because of that, he not only bouts between going up and down between being happy and sad, but the main thing is that he suffers from chronic laughter that yeah. he can't control his laughter But it's not so much just that he was hit in the head. It really dives into the whole, like emotional and physical trauma because Mm -hmm. it's like we won't spoil it much but there is more to the story when it comes to that you know yeah and to quickly um to mention this because we'll definitely touch upon this at the end of uh, towards the end of our podcast and that is um as we promised that one thing was that well we're going to do a podcast involving not only this film but also the king of comedy unfortunately life happens life itself happens that's life and yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> but um, but basically we couldn't add the King of Comedy as well. But as a as a as a bonus, we will we will watch the King of Comedy and do a quick little video about it and try to tie it in with our our episode here. Number one and number two, as you can tell, this was supposed to come out a couple uh, about a week ago. But yeah. The, fortunate thing was that something did come up but we're going to tell the story about the reason uh, why because we were going to go see it yeah. and then something occurred but we're going to save that towards the yeah, end yeah believe me because it ties into the movie so yeah exactly so um, first thing is like uh, we're diving into it and that is the protagonist now to- well you know the funny thing is like it's funny that this movie is like the protagonists are pretty much what would be considered the antagonist is that the term well yeah it's like, coming into that whole idea of it's um it's, it's the we, villain story well we're definitely <laughs> getting that idea because the thing is is that todd phillips joker film it's very um inspired by 70s uh filmmaking and such yeah he said like from the 70s to the 80s on how things were portrayed especially in new york city yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is is that around that time is like let's go around back to 1976 when taxi driver came out and that is we are seeing this movement in the 60s and in the 70s where you get more of the well, who would be seen as the antagonist now mm-hmm. they're going to be the protagonist you can see that in films such as, as Bonnie and Clyde where you see Bonnie and Clyde who should be the villains of any other you know past Hollywood film but now they are the heroes yeah. they're the ones you're supposed to root for and you also have characters like say the French Connections Popeye Doyle who is he's supposed to be the good guy he's the cop he's battling all these evil people but he himself uh, has his own little issues as well how mm-hmm. violent he is how in your face he is it's you got Death Wish, where you know uh, you got Charles Bronson, and you're going to kill people, and <laughs> and I really do love. That's why, I, honestly, I enjoyed both films because it's it goes into the structure of how the movies are made. Mm-hmm. That it's like these people. Like usually, when we watch a movie, we have like the main person is usually the good person, like mm-hmm. the the hero, or like you know, even though they have like certain bad quote unquote qualities about them, you end up just loving them either way. And there's a human element to it. But mm-hmm. when it comes to these movies, it really walks a fine line mm-hmm. into what, a, what, who a person really is. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's, it, it, it kind of like plays back and forth, but you start realizing like, oh no, these people aren't really great, mm-hmm. but they're, the way it's portrayed, it's, it's kind of like, I, I don't want to say that it's like they had a reason to do what they did because no matter what, you have no fucking reason to murder people. Mm-hmm. But it, it's, it, it really plays with that so mm-hmm. much. And it kind of like, it, it hits you a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I really loved that about Taxi Driver and Joker. Yeah. And the thing is, is like, let's just get out the, the way the plot of both films. And as with Taxi Driver, it's set in the mid-70s of New York City, uh, where um, you have the main character, Travis Bickle, who believes that we're going through a, a moral um, decay, not just, not only in regards to, and also how the city itself is in a big pretty much, decay. Yeah, everything's going to shit, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And how he himself comes across uh, two women. How relevant is that to today? Yeah, with Betsy and who's working for um, a politician, Senator Palantine, to get him uh, not only to win a nomination for 
I think it was. I it doesn't say I which for mayor. political party. Right? No, 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 for president. Oh, for president. Yeah, to not only be the, not, not only to be the nominee, but then to go on to win the presidency. You have that, and oh, you that's have. That's true. What, it doesn't show which political party, huh? No, it uh-huh. doesn't. And in the case of Iris, where she is a twelve-year-old um, prostitute, and yeah. it's one of those where ultimately. Um, Travis Bickle. It's it's we go through his 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 everything that he goes through and how um, his depression, how his insomnia is crippling him, and how his you just feel his racism, his hatred for people coming up, mm-hmm. and it's how he wants. It's he's a lonely man, also a walking contradiction. This is as is st- stated in Betsy and stated in the film. Yeah, that. He is one who talks about how everything is going to hell in a handbasket and the scum of the streets and all that. And yet, this is a man who goes and frequents uh, porno theaters. In fact, he took Betsy on a terrible date to a oh porno. Oh my God. And, oh, I cringed at that yeah. moment. Ugh. And also, like in the film um, where he also, I mean, he is a taxi driver and he picks up the people. I mean, there's this one. Wonder- the very people that he hates. Yeah, and there's yeah. this wonderfully disturbing scene where Martin Scorsese, the, the actual director of the film, he plays this character who he has has him drive him to this apartment he goes you see that woman in the window that's my wife but that isn't my apartment and how he's going to get this gun and he's going to shoot not only her going to kill her but kill the man yeah he, and in the case of joker where we follow the story of, of arthur who is a clown who is a clown for hire works for a place called haha's Mm -hmm. And just how his mental instability and how it leads him down this path to where he becomes the Joker. Now, whether he is the Joker that would go on to battle Batman in the future, I have my doubts about that. Because the two main ones are number one, by the time he would face Batman, because, spoiler alert, Bruce Wayne is in the film, and we do get to see Bruce's parents get killed for the billionth time in cinematic history. I I'm, like how it was I'm done. I'm done seeing them get killed. Are, I like but, how it was done. No, whatever. We'll get to that moment in a bit, but, but it's like... Whatever. But the other thing is, like, if you think about it, by the time that Bruce would become Batman... That this Joker would be in his sixties, so they'd be like, "I'm gonna get you, Batman." Yeah. But- <laughs> well, it's funny because in an interview, like even Todd Phillips said that this movie isn't meant to tie in with mm-hmm. DC. Like yeah. it's it's based on everything like that, but it's not meant to like this Joker will not be shown in the next Batman movie. Yeah, you know. So it's like me and you had a discussion um, a few days ago about how we were linking this to the DC universe, and mm-hmm. you were saying like. Uh, a way that you can see it be linked is that this man could be the inspiration for the Joker Mm -hmm. in the DC comic universe. Like that this Joker, whether heard of um, Flex's name or whatever, is that his name? Anthony Flex or something like that? What was his name? Anthony Flex? Um, The guy, Joker. Arthur. Arthur, thank you. Whatever. It's like Anthony Flex? Well, I'm looking at you. I'm asking him like, what's his name? But anyway. Anthony Flex. (laughs) That sounds like a wrestler's name. Coming down the aisle, weighing 240 pounds, Anthony Flex. He wishes. Oh my God. But oh, yeah, um, <laughs> he's just kidding. Because the thing is, is that he does go through a big transformation. It, Joaquin yeah, Phoenix yeah. lost, lost 50 pounds, I believe, to play the part. Yeah, oh my... And, and I think it really added to the whole, like, instability of him. Like, it, it was really, really good. I really liked it. I know me and you have our debates about it, but... Yeah. But also, the other thing is that my... Did quickly out of the way. I don't buy for one second that Arthur would then become this criminal mastermind that the Joker would become. So I buy more. But that's into, the point. But no. But the, no. But the thing is, is that and that's where my friend Cameron, who's a big comic book fan, who would go like, I he would not see this guy who would become the Joker. That's why I believe in this idea of he would become an inspiration for who we would know as the Joker. Yeah, that's fine. Like, here's that the thing, to me, like, I, I find more believable than him becoming the Joker that we all know. Well, I wasn't fighting you about that because like that, I understand that he's an inspiration to what Gotham ended up becoming. Because I mm-hmm. think, if I'm not mistaken, Todd Phillips was saying that he wanted to show Gotham into like the like right before it became the Gotham that we knew. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like he could have been the inspiration for who the actual Joker was mm-hmm. and stuff. Because, I mean, like, they they did link this Joker to Bruce Wayne and his family and all that. The Wayne family. Mm -hmm. So, and I thought it was honestly brilliantly done. But the way that it was shot, it was so, like, unsettling and very unreliable that it really added to the whole story and the whole element, too, of just the Joker in general. And just, like, Mm -hmm. these men who are not only battling their inner demons, but it's just coming out in such a violent way. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, I think in Taxi Driver, his... Violence came... Well, no. No, both of them pretty much came out out of, like, just, whoa. You know? 
Well, I mean, in the case, well, here's the thing, and that is in, in regards to how they're both portrayed, you have Robert De Niro's Travis Bickle, Joaquin Phoenix as Arthur. I think it's Arthur Fleck, not Anthony Flex. You but know what? I love that name, Anthony Flex. I'm going to be obsessed with that name for Shut a long up. time. <laughs> but it's just like how committed both actors are to the role. I mean, you can definitely, you know, see it in terms of their physical transformations in, in both roles. And also... In regards to one big connection that both films have, and the characters is, and this leads to the film grammar term of, of our episode, and that is the unreliable narrator. Yay. Oh, I didn't get to do my film term song. Well, you can do it now. Film term of the day! There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, an unreliable narrator is, because the thing is that when we go to see a movie or we pick up a book, it's we are under the assumption as an audience goer or as an avid reader that what the narrator is saying is what's actually happening, what's transpiring. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that in both films, that, for example, there's uh, throughout the film in Tra Taxi Driver, you get to hear. Um, Robert De Niro narrate it's through his journals through his writings mm -hmm. but you see there's one brilliant moment where you see him uh, going through these it's, it's it contradicts itself the images in the narration where he's writing a letter to his mother about how things are great and how he met this wonderful woman he's referring to Betsy and how great everything is but you see him how he's planning to commit an assassination against Senator Palantine. Mm -hmm. So that's an unreliable narrator there in terms of like he's saying this, but in actuality we're seeing something completely different. And in the case of Joker, there is um, it's this mental instability where it makes you question whether things are actually really happening. And it's funny because I think in he, not. yeah, in his journal I feel like it was kind of the complete opposite. With Taxi Driver, we knew like he was lying on the page, but you we can see on the screen that it's like completely disconnected like this man has no sense of real mm -hmm. reality yeah and even though in the joker like it was the same thing mm -hmm. it was his journal that really stated the truth yeah like it was so weird to me like i kind of saw that comparison I'm like oh i like how it was kind of flipped over a little bit that's like us and as an, as an audience we're believing what's mm -hmm. being seen on the screen through his eyes but then if you really pay attention to his notebook because it was shown a little bit mm -hmm. at a, at a, in a few scenes it's like Holy fuck. Yeah. Like, this man is fucked up. Yeah, and you know? Because the thing is, just like what we're seeing are two lonely men who mm. have their mental instability. And what happens is, instead of finding, you know, positive ways of going about it, mm -hmm. that what happens is, and you can make an argument that the system has failed them. In the yeah. case, in the case of, of Taxi Driver, where he himself coming back as a Vietnam War veteran, that how society has failed him mm -hmm. and as a returning veteran, and in the case of Joker, how he was abused as a child, mm -hmm. and, and how the system has, failed him. has yeah. failed him, has neglected him. And that's, that, to me, is really fascinating, that whole you know commentary on, on both of those. It walks a really fine line because it's like we've come at... We're at an age right now where we're dealing with a lot of mass shootings, a lot of violence. Mm -hmm. So And we are not only so used to hearing it being blamed on mental illness, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that a lot of us are getting tired of it being, like, you know, having mental illness be the thing that's being pointed at. Mm -hmm. But both of these movies really do bring that to light in the sense of like, even though not all horrible crimes were committed by people who were mentally ill, mm -hmm. it is a commentary on society of how we are failing the people who need the help. Mm -hmm. Like in the, in the case of taxi driver, like this man went to war for our country. Mm -hmm. He went to like, you know, like, like all our veterans or all people like in the army right now, like you guys are fighting for our freedom and that's what this man went to do. And he comes back and he's completely disconnected from the world because there's no help for him, you know? So it's like he ends up becoming isolated and that itself kind of triggers all these things. And like the more disconnected you are to reality, the more easy it's going to be mm -hmm. for you to cr like commit these horrible acts because you yourself are just completely disconnected yeah. from everything else so like now with the joker it's kind of the same thing as like as a young boy like as we realized throughout the movie that he was abused and not only was he did he find out he was adopted and he didn't know this he was abused by the woman who adopted mm -hmm. him and he and he pretty much like he grew up taking care of his mother and mm -hmm. In the movie, like, you see him as a grown man already taking care of his mother and, like, he thinks the world of her and all that stuff. But then to realize that your whole reality wasn't even real to begin with mm -hmm. is just, like, what the fuck, right? Yeah, it, and then you see in the movie that he's gone to therapy. He's going to therapy. And it's just, like, 
there's a scene where his therapist says like, look, this is the last time we're seeing each other because funding has been cut and we're, yeah. you know, we, we can't no longer treat you. So it's like, I really love that that stuff is being shown, but I've told you that it, there is a very, it's a very fine line as to mm-hmm. where to go with this because are you blaming, are you, are you blaming our system or are you blaming the people who are mentally ill? Mm. Like, it, but that's why I loved both of these movies because it's, no right or wrong, you know? Yeah, you know what the funny thing is, is thinking about, like, one of my favorite um, scenes um, in Taxi Driver is the fact that, because, you know, we talk about the idea of, you know, masculinity and this idea of, mm-hmm. like, you know, men being allowed to express their emotions or being allowed to cry, how, you know, we're becoming, like, as a society, I think, um, more accepting of that, um, you know, the idea of what it is to be a man. But in Taxi Driver, he does have other um, people that he discusses with, other, you know, cab drivers and such, or friends of the drivers. And the thing is, what they all do in getting together is, is that they start blaming their problems on other people. They start blaming their, pe- their problems on, on prostitutes, on other women, or on, on, on other races, on mm-hmm. black people or Latinos. And they're just fueling that fire. And instead of actually stopping and sitting and thinking, well, wait a minute, why, what is the real fault at hand here? Oh, There's the one yeah. big thing. But the other thing I was also thinking of, there's another great scene where... Um, he reaches out to one of his fellow drivers played by Peter Boyle. Oh, and yeah. He, I love that scene. Yeah, yeah, and it's just how he's uncomfortable and trying to express his emotions and express, like, like what he's going through and how worried he is. It is a call for help, a cry for help. And Peter Boyle doesn't know, his character doesn't know how to respond to yeah. that. He is most likely going through those same struggles and such. Instead, he's like, oh, no, everything's going to be okay. He glosses over it because that's what we're being... Ta- taught we have to been do, taught yeah. to do that oh everything will pass it's in your head and that's the problem it's in your head and that's the issue with comes to people like Travis or Arthur because the scene where Arthur says you know selfishly that you're not listening to me the problem is is that they are listening to you the thing is is that you just like Travis is is that you're not taking you know you're not you're not what you're doing is you're blaming others instead of actually stopping and thinking, well, wait a minute, why am I here? What changes can I do? And instead of making healthy, right choices for their characters, Travis and Arthur go down a darker, dangerous path. Well, it's because like I think it, it, it sums it up by like, you're hearing me, but you're not listening. Yeah. You know, and there's a huge difference with that. And I think I, both of these movies really show that not only with society or even with themselves they're not listening to themselves either like mm-hmm. take a step back and and listen to what you're saying and what you're thinking or what you're plotting on doing mm-hmm. listen and they themselves are not listening because they're so used to other people just glossing over what they're talking about or what they're feeling and it's like even the joke there's one scene again with his therapist where he's like i can't remember what was going on but like he just sat there for a bit he's like you don't listen to me do you you know, and I loved that moment because it's like you can see that she's just glossing over everything he's saying. It's like the signs are there. But then again, know? if we're basing this off of unreliable narration, and that is, you know, maybe she was truly listening. But the thing is, is that he wasn't getting what his, he wanted. Yeah, in mm. his mind, or just like with Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver, and that is, he is not listening. He is yeah. not because this idea of he created this. The, he's got the Madonna whore complex going on yeah. and that he sees Bess, he sees Betsy as his Madonna figure but then when it's she revealed, can't be touched like he said yeah. yeah and then when it's revealed that she is actually a person a yeah. human being a who woman with her own yeah, thoughts who and, doesn't yeah. want to go to the porn theater that she's uncomfortable this with this woman that. has standards and flat out told you you did something I didn't like I'm walking away yeah, and, and now he's like whoa 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 you know you're supposed to be like mine yeah you know and then he starts blaming her because like if, I, if i'm not mistaken in a few scenes after that scene he runs into her office like yeah, where she into like, palatine headquarters yeah. in new york city yeah. and then he's like pretty much blaming her like what the fuck you're rejecting me yeah it's like well first of all women like you guys know that feeling sometimes when you mm-hmm. reject a man like i loved how there's so many small social commentaries throughout the film but i i don't know if that was like I feel like it was the purpose, but it wasn't the purpose. It's kind of, again, like, you take what you want from it type of mm-hmm. movie, like, yeah. from both movies. But it's like, mm-hmm. this man does not want to take responsibility for mm-hmm. anything he has done because he's a war veteran, even though he hasn't flat out said it like that. But, it, like, you can take it as, like, this man fought for our country. He should. Uh, he came back. He's expecting, 
you know, something, yeah. and he got shit. Or, or you know? yeah, and the other thing is that you compare con, con, you compare and contrast that with Arthur going and fuck because he wants to be a stand up comedian. He wants to be he wants just like his idol in, in on the talk show with Murray, but was played by really? Robert De Niro. Well, once again, played by Robert De Niro. Yeah. He wants to be that. And he wants to be loved. He wants to to create laughter and bring smiles to people. But the thing is that it's it's shown is, and you see you see two versions of it of that scene. Mm-hmm. One. The first time, where it's in Arthur's head, where it starts off awkwardly at first, but then suddenly the crowd is applauding and laughing. And, and he's and falls for him. Yeah. yeah, it's unreliable narration because then we see what the truth of it is, and that is there is a recorded footage of him. And, and it's his comedy presented, stand-up, yeah. Yeah, and it's presented on the Murray on Murray's show, who's a talk show host, and it's a stated play by Like Niro. a late-night show. Yeah. Think of it that way, yeah. Think of it like a Johnny Carson-type figure. And here he is, and it's a father figure, and he shows the truth that his comedy routine was awful and that he's being laughed at and mocked at, made fun of by this father figure. Yeah, and we have to mention father figure when it came to that because in the first scene, like when we thought at first, it was like, oh, is this really happening? But it turned out it was like, you know, all in his head. Once again, fueling unreliable narrator. And I loved how they did it. Oh my God, it was so amazing. But in that scene, um, you know, like uh, Murray uh, points Arthur out in the... Like it, on the crowd, and he makes him stand up, and he starts talking or whatever. He goes down, he hugs him, and then he ends up saying, "You know, I would give this all up if I could have a son like you." Something like that, mm-hmm. and, and hugs him, and then like you know, just get to the next scene and stuff. And then now, fast forward to that scene that you're talking about—the actual scene, what ended up happening, how yeah. Murray ends up finding out about Arthur. Mm-hmm. It's like in the worst way possible. This man that you want to be your father because you're lonely. You never had a father figure to begin with. Mm-hmm. This man is mocking you on live television yeah. for the world to see. And it's like, holy fuck, you know? Yeah. And it's really, really good. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, I mean, let's all like point towards like the, the craftsmanship of the people behind the scenes. In the Ooh, case of for both movies. Yeah, in the case of Taxi Driver, you've got Michael Chapman, who did the cinematography, who would work with Robert De Niro. I'm sorry, work well, he would work with De Niro again and with Martin Scorsese lensing, you know, uh, Raging Bull, which he was nominated for an Oscar for. And you have Lauren Scheer, who has a uh, healthy collaboration with Todd Phillips, who did the cinematography of the Hangover movies. He himself lends Joker. And how both filmmakers, how both cinematographers go at it. In the case of Michael Chapman, and the thing is, uh, like with Scorsese, is one of his favorite films. He loves the work of Powell and Pressburger, two British filmmakers, and the usage of the color red. One of his favorite films is called The Red Shoes. And throughout... Taxi Driver, you see this color of red intensified, and it's like it becomes like it's it's maybe headache-inducing. It adds to that fuel to Travis's fire that as he drives down the streets of New York City, through the streets of Harlem and the Bronx and what have you, mm-hmm. and it's 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 headache-inducing, and it's like that red just comes more and more and more intense or like the like you see like the reflections all over the place or how maybe a lens flare now it just feels like the blood that's going to be shed because of everything that's happening yeah and also just like it kind of adds to this whole dreamlike quality or like your own hell pretty much yeah you know like and i really loved loved the way this uh uh the movie taxi driver was shot because it's because it had this kind of dreamlike quality to it Mm -hmm. but it still had a a way of realism that it, 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 it and I, it gave you that state of in between falling asleep and awake, you know, mm-hmm. that, that very just, I don't know if you guys like, I, I forgot what the actual term is, but like, it's in between being asleep and awake. You don't know what's real, what's not mm-hmm. like in reality, whatever. So it's, I loved this movie and added so much to it and added so much to the character and the plot and everything. It's yeah. And, and you know me, I usually oh, don't yeah. like watching movies yeah. like this. And it's and it's also like how they shoot it to where um how like for with Travis Bickle, how he feels iced alone. Like there are scenes where he is with his friends and they're communicating. He is sitting off you know, off the center of the frame near the end of the edge of the frame that he's isolated and alone. Like yeah, just to, like in Joker as well. Like and this is why I really loved um how it was um how do you call it? Oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. How it was framed? How it was framed and, like, the comparison. Because, you know, if people have been uh, paying close attention to the Joker movie and everything that's been talked about, it is really, really compared to The King of Comedy and Taxi Driver. Mm -hmm. And we watched Taxi Driver first. I've never seen the movie before, before watching Joker as Mm -hmm. well. And so when we watched the Joker, I was like, ooh, 
this reminds me of Taxi Driver. This is like how it was shot and this and that and that. Yeah. But I don't mean that in a bad way. It mm-hmm. was like such a beautiful ode to it, like to the movie as well. Beautiful. Like, I don't know if that's the right word to say, well, but like. I mean, yeah, how the shot, I mean, because the other thing that Lawrence Sher does that Michael Chapman doesn't do is that there are um, several handheld shots in it. So, for example, mm. when um, when he commits his first three murders in the film, uh, Arthur Fleck, that Arthur does this dance in a bathroom and just how it's shot, how you're moving along with him. That it's like it's uncomfortable because the thing is, is that, um, you know, learning this from one of my um, film professors is that, um, you know, when you shoot a musical, that the best course of action in shooting a musical and showing a dance is to show them full, you know, show them from head to foot. And that way you see them clearly dancing. In this case, Todd Phillips and his cinematographer, Mr. Lauren Shear, they decide we're going to go in there. And so you are lockstep with his madness and you can't pull away. Mm-hmm. And it's like there is something beautifully macabre about how he dances and how you're watching how his movements are, but it's also very unsettling. So unsettling. It's kind of like a different creature. Like, what? I, I don't know. It's kind of very alien like in a way to me. It's like oh, yeah. this man is so out of his, not, I, I'm going to say element, so out of his element because you'll see towards the end of the movie that it's just like, you know. Um, that oh god I don't even know how to describe it but I will say that despite whatever people think of Joker and stuff like that Joaquin Phoenix did such an amazing amazing job Mm -hmm. you know and I really liked also how both well actually I don't know about uh, Taxi Drivers do you let me know how that uh, the relationship between the actors and the director and like the creative Mm -hmm. process but like with Joker um, Todd Phillips that's the director right Mm -hmm. Todd Phillips um, he the, the movie was pretty much being developed as it went along. Like, yeah. he gave the actors a lot of creative freedom. They did yeah. a lot of improvisation. And I feel that th- not only did that add to the connection between characters, it also added to the disconnection mm-hmm. as well. Because you have to show that this character is very disconnected from a lot of people. Yeah. You know? And it's like, I, I feel that, like... You can't fake that. Oh, well, I mean, yes, actors are supposed to act and like be able to convey that, but I feel that because of the way Todd Phillips was able to do the movie the way he did it, um, mm-hmm. and also he did another cool thing in the movie that I'll, I'll have you talk about that when it comes to the score and stuff, mm-hmm. is that um, he just let them do them pretty much, you know? Yeah. And the thing is also like, this is the second collaboration with Test Driver, the second collaboration between De Niro and uh, Scorsese where they first, uh, they first worked on Mean Streets, which helped, you know, propel uh, Scorsese as this up and coming filmmaker. Um, I think the film was released in 1973 if memory serves. And the, and the other thing is that I want to talk about the, before the, com- uh, the score, I have to quickly mention the editing in Taxi Driver and that is, um, it's not edited by Scorsese's long-term film editor, Thelma Schoomaker, who they, they've gone way back when they were actually working on uh, Woodstock, where Thelma Schoomaker was working on that film in the late 60s. Um, but they started for... They, Raging Bull was their big first example. She won an editing Oscar for that. The thing is, with editing in a Scorsese film, in particular in Taxi Driver, is just how it's able to convey... Travis Bickle's descent into madness. I don't think so much in Joker with the editing, but definitely in the case of Tra- and Taxi Driver, where um, there's a sequence, this montage, where it's him driving his cab, and you see him passing by this green light, and then you know picking up other pedestrians, and you see the same green light, and then you see it again, and it's then repetition. you see it again, yeah. and again, and it's like you start to then, it's like... Go you, crazy you, with you, him Well, you lose bit. time. You lose yeah. all sense of time. It's like there's also like I, one thing I noticed is that there's this box of cereal I believe on Travis Bickle's um, uh, table, his dining table, and and you just wonder, wait a minute, that's the same uh, box of cereal. So did he decide not to throw it away, or is it because we are losing ourselves into Travis Bickle's madness that we start to lose any semblance of what is well, what day it is, what mm-hmm. time it is. We are part of that. And not and, only and that, the that process he's a, helps. Yeah, not only that, but he's like a creature of habit. You yeah. know, it's like it's the same thing, like you said, like with the lights and stuff, like I interpret it as like not only are we getting lost in time with him and all that stuff, but also it's like life is just that repetition. Mm-hmm. Over and over and over and over and yeah. over and over again. And An unhealthy like, one. And a very unhealthy one, exactly. It's like the fact that he kept his apartment in a way that it's like, I'm not moving shit because this is what I know. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, 
although this is mine. I'm going to keep it there because I might lose it. Or the flowers were there that he wanted to give to Betsy, but they just rotted away until mm-hmm. finally he decides to Just like his one. mind, basically. Yeah. You know, it kind of represented like in the, he had, there was some hope and mm-hmm. it's just, that shit yeah. we just died. And the other factor to it is like, as uh, Salome was mentioning in regards to the scores, and that is for uh, Joker, you have a cellist composer. Her name is Helder uh uh, Gerda Nitu, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Mm-hmm. And in uh, Taxi Driver, you have Academy Award winning, w- world renowned movie legend Bernard Herrmann. This was his last film score he did before passing away. In fact, he died before tra- Taxi Driver was released. Mm-hmm. So he didn't get a chance to, you know, to see how his score, w- and I, at least I don't think he was able to see how his score was used and how, how, um, how that score would go down as one of his most memorable. Scores, and that is in the case of Taxi Driver, there are you know this unsettling music. There's like a bum 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 in terms of percussion. That's very unsettling. But mm-hmm. then there's this this beautiful little saxophone music that that I want to point out. This is a true story. Um, about a couple of months ago, um, Salome went to go get a massage done, and mm-hmm. just you know sitting there, and I hear da 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 da, and I'm like, oh no, it's the thing. It's like <laughs> it's like I'm expecting Travis Bickle to. To shoot, to come in and start shoot. Unfortunately, you know, shooting up the place because, but this is an unsettling song for you because it, you you knew the reference. Yeah, yeah. Because it's done that way. It's like it's it is a very romantic theme, but then you see what it's being the images in the song. It's being juxtaposed, and that and is I it's, loved the contrast between that. Yeah, it was so good, and and I I see more filmmakers doing that and stuff, but it's just like something so cool about. Having this song that, like, if it wasn't associated with this movie, it's like, ah, oh, you know, let, let's dance together, baby. You know, like, yeah. whatever. But then you just see that it, it's connected to madness, you yeah. know? It's like, holy fuck. But also, remember, if memory serves, I think, didn't that music play during the scene where um, a character named Sport, played by Harvey Keitel, who is the pimp for Jodie Foster's uh, character, that... Isn't that music being played while he's dancing with her? This much Ooh, older man? Good question. Yeah. A good I, question. I, I don't know. I might want to check I that out. I think yeah. that did occur. So it's like what's happening is you have this beautiful music being played mm-hmm. with all these, all these disturbing fucking people. Yeah. And not just the people, but these disturbing images and ideas. And also the fact that it's being played while he's you know driving around um, uh, New York and his big movie screen or TV screen are the windows of his cab and how yeah. he sees the world going to shit in his opinion. Yeah, but the music is there to just mask everything, just like, you yeah. know, kind of society in general is like, like, I, I don't want to say that the music will be, represent the media or anything, but it's like, there's horrible shit happening, but you know, hey, let's distract you with this instead. Yeah, and, in, yeah, and in the case of, and then an opposite way with Hilder's score, Hilder's score, Hilder's score, Hilder's score, Hilder's score, Hilder's score <laughs> and <laughs> Joker. like Betty White in the oh, Golden Girls when she yeah. does like her. <laughs> oh no, we mustn't do the Gick and Frickin' Dugan. Yeah. You're from St. Olaf, I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah, and <laughs> um, in, in the case of, of Hilder's score in, in Joker, it's definitely very unsettling, but I stated she was a cellist, she um, worked with with Johan Johansson, who was a very talented composer before mm-hmm. he passed away a couple of years ago, that it's it creates this unsettling world for it, where the score itself it's 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 beautiful, but it's also very unsettling. I mean, it's definitely it's more I if you had to choose, it, it's definitely non-traditional, but I guess also traditional in the sense of that. You know, you kind of expect this for a movie about like a crazy guy to kind of have a crazed type of score. Yeah. And what's really cool about the score too, um, I'm guessing this wasn't done in Taxi Driver, but either way, it didn't like it, it didn't hurt the film. But like mm-hmm. with the Joker, um, they ended up doing the score before they shot the movie, so it's like uh, Todd Phillips ended up having the score play as uh, in certain scenes when. Um, Joaquin Phoenix was acting or whatever to kind of help inspire him and get into the Joker role. And I think that really influenced the quality of the film, which Mm -hmm. is like, I don't know if you know on the top of your head any movies that have done that that helped like improve like just well, how things are shot, everything. Well, but because he said that he added that not only to the actors, but mm-hmm. he had it play in like the dressing rooms, like behind the scenes, to have the whole crew get into the same mentality and vibe. Well, I can tell you this: that um, one filmmaker who definitely has a big influence on Scorsese, and I'm assuming an influence on Phillips as well, is an Italian filmmaker named Federico Fellini, who mm-hmm. did films like La Dolce Vita, Eight and a Half. Yeah. And the thing is, is 
And this is more of a, if memory serves, more of a byproduct of how the Italians would make their films in the 50s and the 60s and such. And that is that they would, like, you know how when they're making a movie, you have, like, the, the guy who's in charge of the boom mic. So you'd mm-hmm. see that one fellow, he's got the big, you know, long stick with the microphone at the end, and they're recording the dialogue of the actors. And, of course, most of the time, the actors will come back in post, and they would do additional dialogue recording, or ADR, mm-hmm. so, you know, to clean up so that way if, you know, if they're talking, they clean up so then it sounds like this so you can hear it clearly yeah but anyways what Fellini would do is he would do away with that he would have the actors still speak their dialogue but what he would do is he would play music over the scenes so then if you watch the movies and you see that there's a a movement to the actors as if there's a bit of a dance going on Mm -hmm. that's the reason why that they are essentially moving to the music I love that because every time, yeah. like, I, I don't know, I mean, both of, like, me and you are have loved films since we were kids, so, like, I know for a fact me and you have had that moment where you're playing a scene in your head, or, like, that you're the actor or whatever, and then you have this song playing in the background, and you're just kind of, like, moving with it, too. It's, mm-hmm. like, it's so brilliant to me. And also what I really loved about Joker, and I've seen this whole, like, big movement with movies that are using already established music to add into their scores, and or, like music, whatever, in there. And I loved how they used the song Smile. Mm-hmm. I Because I love that song. I love that song yeah. so much. And to those who don't know, Smile was a song written by Charles Chaplin, Charles Champlin, yeah. who there's actually a scene in the movie where they go to see a premiere. Maybe maybe it's a bit on the nose, maybe. But it's where they're seeing modern times being, mm-hmm. be playing on the screen. And so, but no, you see that and you hear, you know, Sen and the Clowns, you know, kind of have those, you know... Songs being played in the yeah. background. And that's live, of course. Oh, that one too. <laughs> I, I really liked it because it really added to this whole like element to it. Like the irony of it all. Like, you know, smile even though yeah. you're shaking. And it's like you see this man that's like, oh no, legit, he is going crazy. But he's been taught or like he had it drilled in his head that he's supposed to smile because he's going to bring joy mm-hmm. and happiness to a lot of people. You know, so it's kind of like... And remind me like... Please remind me at the end scene of the movie when he's mm-hmm. like yes. driving in the car as a joke already, and like there's like chaos yeah. all around. And the how scene. it mirrors the beginning of the film where he's on the bus and how he's at a low state in his life, and now he's at a high state in his life. No, not that. Well, I mean, yes, that yeah. too. Just but we put that were in. they playing the song "Smile" at that moment, or or not? I don't because... recall. I thought it was Hilder's score. If memory serves. Okay, we're gonna have to like if you guys have watched the movie, please let us know in the comments. But like. I could, I, if it was Smile, like, I thought that was brilliant because it's, like, again, like, in the beginning, like, you know, that, that song was shown that he's, like, trying to achieve that and then at the end, in his mind, he achieved that. Like, mm-hmm. look at all these people. Even though it's fucking chaos and murder and fire and just death, he's smiling. He's like, yeah, mm-hmm. I brought joy to all these people. Like, yeah. it's insane to me. Like, I thought it was so well done. But, yes, going to that comparison that you are talking about, I love how... um I remember more in The Joker than in Taxi Driver, but I'm pretty sure you can remember. Mm -hmm. There's, like, these elements where, like, it kind of is like a callback. Like you said, that specific scene in the very beginning of the movie, we see um, Arthur just, you know, like, he's just going through life. You know, everything's fucking shitty. Mm -hmm. He's not the Joker yet. He's looking out the bus window, just looking at this world that rejected him, that no one notices him. He's just Mm -hmm. hated and then at the end of the movie, where he's finally who he, his true self, his true essence. Yeah. And he's seeing all of this, uh, like, chaotic world around him because of him. Yeah. He created it. And, like, I just loved both of those shots. The comparison of, like, who he was and who he is mm-hmm. now. You know? I loved that so much. Yeah. And the other thing is I definitely want to talk about with the endings, where it's, like, in the case of Taxi Driver, at the end of the film, where... Um, Travis Bickle fails at at, com- at committing a, an assassination and trying to kill Senator Palantine. So what he does instead is he goes and he kills um, Iris's pimp, um, this drug, this criminal ma- uh, lord, this crime lord who was going to have underage sex with this with Iris and also uh, a bouncer at this seedy little hotel mm-hmm. um, for child prostitution. And then he becomes a hero. And then at the 
I mean, some folks think, oh, maybe it's just a dream or maybe it isn't. I take what Paul Schrader said, and that is the writer of Texas Driver, and he said that at the end of the film where you see Betsy get in the car, but always in the reflection, like in, of De Niro, of, of Travis Bickle through his eyes, and at the end when suddenly you see him look in the rear from mirror and see, he sees something and suddenly it, it goes like... It, goes kind of crazy again in terms of the camera zoom yeah. and the edit and then so it's like how Paul Schrader says is that he thinks that you could just then begin the film over again because he this isn't over that he will do another murder and another one yeah. and another it's just like a man got away with it and yeah. now like in, in I remember me and you were talking about just how uh, these villains are being interpreted and it's a very fine line of also, again, a commentary. Oh, well, here's the thing, though. I don't know if these are the intentions, but it's like, mm. I love that both of these movies can be a, what I like to say, a beauty's in the eye of the beholder type of movie, mm -hmm. where like you will take out of it what you want to take out of it. Mm -hmm. Like, whatever is close to your heart, you'll most likely identify with that part, you know, type of thing. So with me, it was a lot about mental illness and just how society, like, you know, takes certain things and all that stuff. But like, it's just... Like time and time again, it has been shown that we end up trying to glorify these, whether domestic terrorism, like uh, people, like whether mass shootings and stuff, that people always like mentioning their name. They're like, oh, this person did this. Let's do the background of that person, blah, blah, blah. Like, and we somehow, in some weird fucking way, make them heroes. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what happened in Taxi Driver. Like, this man legit was just out to fucking kill. Like, even though, yes, he ended up killing these assholes that. They were essentially raping a girl. Like, I don't care if, like, you know, she was a prostitute, but well, that's, so it's, it's still fucking rape. Exactly. It's, yeah. So these, like, I had a very conflicting, like, feeling when I saw that scene because I was like, holy fuck, no, dude, dude, dude. But then I was like, but these men deserved it. <laughs> like, I don't know. So it's kind of this weird of, like, way of how society is kind of playing God mm -hmm. a little bit, you yeah. know? And it's really weird to me that it's just, like... Both movies were able to kind of have that fine line. I feel for me personally, I guess maybe just because it's a more modern film. I don't know. Like, I, I don't want to be biased or anything. But, like, I feel that the Joker uh, movie kind of hit that a little bit more closer for me than Taxi Driver. But at the same time, when I'm logically thinking about it, both movies did it beautifully. Yeah. You know? And the other thing is like thinking of like the ending of say Joker where you see him walking down the the, the, the you see him walking down the hallway of Arkham white floors and you see the blood bloody footprints and then he <gasps> oh, goes and then thing. he's chased by you know an orderly he goes one way the orderly chases him then he goes another way the orderly chases him again it's sort of like you can take it on a surface of he just killed this new therapist at Arkham Asylum. And you know, he's just running away. But I also took it like as another way, and that is he as will commit another atrocity and that he'll get away, but he'll get caught, but then he'll get away. Mm -hmm. That to me. But one thing is like now as we, you know, uh, we're gonna go into the controversies of, of the film to wrap it up. I mean, both films have been met with a big controversy in the case of Taxi Driver because of its violence and its depiction of, you know, an underage girl being sold into prostitution that you've got John Hinckley Jr. who was uh, the, this uh, crazed man who tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan in 1981 and what happened was he you know didn't get away with it but he said the reason why he did was because he was inspired by Taxi Driver he wanted to impress Jodie Foster and in the case of Joker where you've got people who first saw the film in Venice and Toronto were saying this film's going to start riots and that there were real threats. Uh, that some that were so legitimate that police officers went to the theaters to make certain that nothing happened. That which leads us to our story. And the reason why this episode uh, wasn't done um, until today, why we didn't meet last week's deadline. So Salome, take it over. Why? Uh, so what happened? Yeah, so we went to watch the movie... Because it came out on Thursday night here yeah. in Vegas. So it's like we went to go watch it. Mm -hmm. And as you know, like the controversy surrounding it, there was like a, a lot on the news about how there was some credible threats that there was going to be mass shootings in a lot of the screenings. So it's like throughout the whole weekend, there was um, a lot of policemen uh, in a lot of the theaters. If I'm not mistaken, an actual one theater stopped showing it for a little bit until the, it, it, came, it went over. But... So we went into the movie theater, and first thing I noticed, there were some cops there. You know, it was like, and for me, it should have put, put me at ease, but it didn't. And a little background to this as well, um, as for some of you people who might not know, I 
do deal with anxiety. I do deal with depression and it's like, and uh, whether stemming from personal trauma or actual like physical trauma from like accidents, like one recent one from a previous. So it's like, and also dealing with fibromyalgia. So like having all of this all together, like I'm dealing with my brain fog and I'm dealing with anxiety from what, everything that's stemming. So it's like, I'm already on edge. So we go into the theater, we're sitting like, it's like the first row before like there's like a dip and then there's like seating right near the like the we're getting screen. closer to the screen we're getting closer to the screen right so we're sitting there like front and center and I notice this man sitting in front of us like because we're looking down at him because of how the the theater was structured and I, he's uh, uh, head to toe in black right at first I don't think much of it I'm like whatever and but I started noticing as the movie started um, and mind you I'm already on edge he wasn't paying attention to the movie whatsoever. He was not looking at the movie. He kept fidgeting. He kept looking over his shoulder at the theater, um, like uh, people who would pass by. And like he would reach into his pocket and then kind of pull out and then kind of just like sit there. He again, start fidgeting again, grab his water bottle, drink it really quick and kind of just like fidget with his water bottle. And again, look over his shoulder, but never looking at the fucking movie. And so at this point, when I noticed that, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't watch the movie. Mm -hmm. I just kept watching him. And then I, and this is where my, my mind really kind of like, I got really triggered for some stupid reason. I saw him pull out a phone and it was a flip phone and my mind instantly went to a burner phone and I was like, what man his age has a flip phone? What the fuck? Like, and I saw him cause I saw him looking at whatever he was looking at the screen. It was a really long ass paragraph cause we were that close enough to him. And so I was kind of like, okay, that's weird. And then he puts it down, he puts his phone away and then kind of reaches back to like his, like, cause he had a kind of like a hoodie type of jacket or something like that. He kind of reaches in and then he pulls out and it's looking again and it's kind of like his uh, leg is bouncing back and forth. And at this point I start having a panic attack because my, again, because of what's been going on in the media, I was like, is this man going to do something? Mm -hmm. You know, and I started freaking out and that's when you notice you're like, hey, are you okay? And at first I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. But then within not even 15 minutes, I ha we had to walk out. Like I was not watching the movie because I was intently watching this man not watch the movie either and have his whole attention to like who was behind him and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we just got out of there and, um, I, 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 I can't remember if I cried or not. Uh, I was just honestly so you were shell shocked. I was shocked. And luckily, of course, nothing happened. Luckily, like, because I mean, I, <laughs> I didn't even, I don't even know if I told you this, honey, but I did not sleep that night. Like, honest, I oh, fell no. asleep, but then I woke back up and I kept getting on my phone, getting on the news, trying to see if anything happened mm -hmm. because you have no idea how much I was like, if something happened and we didn't report it because there was police officers there. Like, what if I was responsible for like lives that were like killed or something? Yeah. And I'm kind of getting a little emotional now because it's for people who do not, who, who deal with anxiety or, or like mental illness or anything like that. It's something very terrifying. And this movie already, the sub subject matter to begin with is, it walks a very fine line. And so I was honestly petrified of something mm -hmm. happening. So, I mean, this was on Thursday and we were supposed to film on Sunday. And then you were telling me like, okay, we can come back tomorrow. And I was like, no, I can't. I, I honestly, like, I pretty much kept getting frozen in fear. Like, I was so mm -hmm. fucking scared. And I thought it was just me, honestly. And I remember, like, you know, going back to work and talking to my friends. And they're like, oh, you know, how, how, was, it, how was the movie? Because I told them we were going to go watch the movie. Like, we saw it on Thursday. But, like, um, oh, no, then I, had, I talked to them on Friday. That's why. Um, so, like, they're like, oh, how was the movie? And I was like, well, I didn't go. <laughs> and they're like, why not? So I ended up telling them why. And I'm not kidding you. Most of my friends that I talked to who I told them that, they told me that's the exact same reason why they didn't go to the movies yet. Yeah. That they were whether going to wait until it's in a streaming service or they're just not going to watch it because they're genuinely scared of something happening. And so we did end up going it like uh, going to see it then following uh, this past Wednesday or Thursday. I can't remember when, but again, my anxiety started coming up once we walked to the theater. And I remember telling you, or I actually you know what I don't remember if I told you or not, but I was looking at the exits and I was trying to see which way because of the way how that theater was structured i was like okay there's a few blocks here like am i able to jump this pole here to run to the exit and i think i no i think i did tell you hey honey if anything happens just make sure to duck mm -hmm. like make sure to get down and 
and I wasn't being paranoid. Like this was genuinely stemming from a fear of something happening, a mass shooting happening or because as we know, like in a, uh, uh, something like that did happen a few years ago with the premiere of Dark Knight. Right, the Dark Knight Rises, yeah, that Knight awful Rises. tragedy in Aurora, Co- Aurora Colorado. Colorado yeah. yeah, so it's not like this fear is unwarranted or it's like coming out of nowhere. It's because that's in the world that we live in now. Yeah. So like, also again, so if you guys notice if I was a little more off in this episode, it is because I have not been able to shake that anxiety away at all. And, like, mind you, I loved both of these movies, but it does hit me in a different way because I genuinely do have this huge fear of something like that happening. Mm-hmm. Because, again, because all this stuff that's happening, it's always being blamed on mental illness. Yeah. And it's like, you know, as someone who deals with mental illness, that is such a horrible thing and a horrible portrayal to do. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there is a reason why it's being mm-hmm. mentioned. So, so yeah, like, I, I don't know. I've been just feeling in this weird, foggy state of mind that I haven't been able to really fully process certain feelings because of it or even be able to fully talk about the movie how I want to talk about mm-hmm. it because it's like I feel like my mind is getting to this protective mode of like, okay, I'm just going to blur everything for you and just until you relax because I've been on edge ever since. Yeah. And the thing is, and as I thank you for telling all this, all that baby bear, I love you. And, I love you too, Mike. And the thing is, I just keep thinking, uh, when the Virginia Tech um, murders occurred when I was in, in college, I remember a film professor of mine, uh, Professor Wagner, he mentioned, he said that, uh, you know, that he always felt that universities were sort of like a, a, a sacred temple to him. That why, like, that they were a place to go to learn, to, to be safe. <laughs> to, me, that was my chair. Yeah, that was a chair, was it? <laughs> I wasn't, I was nobody did not let anything loose, I swear. I'm sorry. It's like nobody, I accidentally yeah. pushed my chair. Yeah, sure you did. But, but. I pushed uh, too hard. But, <laughs> but anyways, um, he said that he was just, it just saddened him that, the, that such a sacred in- institution as, as education and such, that it would be that these awful acts of murder would occur. And it's just now it's to that point to where, you know, we see it to the movie theater, and that is that this is a place that we all go. The, the best movies are the ones, it doesn't matter how long the movie is, it doesn't matter when the movie was released or where the movie takes place, the language, how it was made, black and white, color, animation, science fiction, fantasy, horror, it, it doesn't matter whatever it is to tell the story, and that is we all go to relate to these characters or the to to our have these to emotional escape, connections honestly. to escape. Yeah. And the thing is is that that's been, you know, threatened by these awful atrocities. Yeah. And it's funny because like I know me and you sorry, I don't I'm just like getting emotional, I'm like kinda of crying. But like me and you have talked about it before of like I've been having this huge fear of just even going out to whether yeah. like um a festival or a concert, you know, I'm, I'm always literally, even at work, I'm constantly thinking like, where are the exit signs? Where, what's the safest way to get there or get out of there or whatever. And you've told me like, we cannot let fear rule our, our no. lives. Like we have to go out there and live life to the fullest. And mm-hmm. the one passion that me, sorry, the, the passion that me and you have are movies. Yeah. So it's like, it's movies for both of us have always been a way to connect and also disconnect from the world. So to have, <laughs> I don't know why I'm so emotional. Um, so to have this fear, a very valid, a valid fear now, unfortunately, of a place where it's supposed to be like people getting together to mutually watch a movie and whether laugh together, cry together, or connect or disconnect from the world together, to have that feel threatened and it's not even safe for that anymore. To have that taken away. It's taken from you. away. And like, don't get me started on like schools and all that stuff either, because that yeah. was a whole other thing when my little sister was in school. Um, it, it's something really sad and horrible in the world because yeah. it's like these movies are meant here to like whether educate us or or help us just, you know, forget about the realities of the world and what's really going on. Yeah. And so it, it sucks. It really yeah. sucks. And I'm not going to lie for like the whole week. I was like, fuck, I ruined our episode because we could <laughs> not record but, like for the life of me. I couldn't. And then like even right until you, you know, start pressed record for this podcast. I was like, 
I don't know what to say. I'm still in this weird fog state of mind of still trying to just calm down and it's not happening, you know? Yeah. Oh, but having but that you've done a great job. Thank you, honey. You know, all I wanted was a compliment. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but having that said, these uh, both of these movies really, and I remember like right after we watched The Joker, we had a huge debate about it. And I go back into what I said about how the beauty is in the eye of the beholder for this film. And I hate using the word beauty, but that's what the the actual saying is. Um, is th- both of these movies you will take out of it whatever you want mm-hmm. you know it's like is there an actual like at least with the joke or well, even taxi driver like well taxi driver has more of a purpose on what it really wants to show but at least with joker it's one of those like what is the message mm-hmm. you know like w- w- what actually is trying to be said and it's like that's up to you mm-hmm. to find out what did you take from it you know type of thing yeah. so it's like movies like this yes should be made and there's nothing bad about that even though it really, like, with the whole controversy is happening of, like, uh, this movie should not be shown because it's going to promote violence. It's going to promote um, having people, like, again, like, who are domestic terrorists and these shooters be glorified and give them a reason to want to do these horrible acts. Because look at the Joker. He was praised. But I didn't take that shit. Because, again, going back to our film from the an unreliable narrator, it's like... That's that's not what the point of this movie is, and I feel like mm-hmm. for that reason alone, it should be watched. I think that at the end of the day, though, is everyone, it's go still see movies. Go. Go see them in a movie theater. Just go. It's like, don't let these people win who try to scare you or terrify you. Just mm-hmm. you still go, because movies are worth watching. Living life, that's what it is. Life is worth living, and those yeah. people... They're not worth it. They truly aren't. So, um, as we you know, we conclude this episode of something else. <laughs> that was something fun. New, um, <laughs> Sorry. We will, we, we will say this. We will be back next week. Yeah. Um, there's only uh, we have to be honest with you. Unfortunately, we are in Oscar season, and there are many movies we do want to cover. But the problem is, is that many of these movies uh, we want to do comparing something old, something new to. Mm-hmm. we don't have a reliable release date because we're not in the major markets like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago that sometimes we get week, uh, uh, movies like a week or two if not a month later yeah, so we're which talking which is weird because we, Vegas is always showing fucking movies why yeah. the hell aren't we getting it's, movies it's unfortunate it. so it's like episodes <laughs> where I can tell you what we have on like we're going to be comparing and contrasting Life, it's Be- Life is Beautiful with Jojo Rabbit we're going to dive into black and white surrealism with David Lynch's Eraserhead compare and contrast that with The Lighthouse mm-hmm. and we have a bunch of other ones as well but for next week's episode unfortunately not yet but we will be back and we will have a really fun entertaining episode so <laughs> so this is david and this is salome and I'm saying thank you all for listening and treat each other with kindness listen to one another and do your best to love one another <laughs>